Hello and welcome to The Actor and the Engineer. My name is Paul James. I am the actor. My name is Josh Knapp. I'm the broadcast engineer. All right, Josh, buckle up. Here we go. Is this your favorite <laughs> episode or is it the favorite movies episode like of the year? Every year that we do, which one do you like better? The one where you already know the the winners or the one where you get to say who who will win? Oh, that's an interesting question. I don't know. I'd have to think about it. I, I pretty much like both. I like the episodes where I can pronounce everything. <laughs> oh, good. Well, there you go. Yeah. Well, now, once the <laughs> once the Oscars have happened, we will have heard people say the names of, well, of course, you could call Adina Menzel. What was it? <laughs> Oh, God. Adele Dezim. Adele Dezim. That I can pronounce. His mispronunciation, I can pronounce. <laughs> but not, Go not her real name. Oh, yes, okay. <laughs> well, either way, we'll try our best. But we're going to be going through the big ones. We'll definitely touch on what we think in this year's Oscars, which of the nominees we think will win and which nominee individually we would like to win. So... We'll just start off with, I'm going to try to do it in the same order that they did it last year. We're going to obviously not do every single one of them, but we'll start with a supporting actor. So this year in the supporting actor race, you've got Paul Racy for Sound of Metal, Sasha Baron Cohen for Trial of Chicago 7, Daniel Kaluuya and Lakeith Stanfield for Judas and the Black Messiah, and Leslie Odom Jr. for One Night in Miami. So what do you think? Who will win? Daniel Kaluuya. And... Rightfully so. I'm all about him winning. All about him winning. Uh, He was a standout. We talked about how he accomplished an Academy Award winning performance without doing the cry, the sob, the big monologues, any of that. It was a consistent character from beginning, middle, and end that you felt Mm -hmm. empathetic towards at the end of the film. And I felt I could start my education about that man by seeing Mm -hmm. that film. And that's exactly what I've done. I've done some research, not much, but some research into that subject matter. And I am re-watching The Trial of the Chicago 7 right now. And at the time, you had mentioned that Fred Hampton was in that also, but I guess I just didn't put it together. I don't know why, I just didn't. And so it's fascinating to see one actor play him in a much smaller role and then see what Daniel Kaluuya did. And they, I, I think they both brought that energy to it. But Daniel Kaluuya is, in my opinion, if there are There's two locks in this race, and I think he's one of them. That said, I think he will win, but who would I vote for? Lakeith Stanfield. Interesting. Here's why. Because nobody is celebrating the fact that he is an Oscar nominee. Everybody is caught up in this conversation about he's in the wrong category. He, you know, category fraud, category fraud. And somebody even said both of them are in the wrong category. Jesse Plemons should be in this category. Well, Jesse Plemons is not in this category. Daniel Kaluuya is, and Lakeith Stanfield is. And I feel like, wouldn't it be really fun if one of these dark horses won, like just out of the (laughs) blue, the person that nobody's focused on at all wins. And for some reason, maybe the underdog in me and always being the underdog, if you will, and rising above, There's something about, I can put my vote behind Lakeith Stanfield because one, he deserves it. And two, will anybody else? Probably, but not enough Mm -hmm. to allow him to win unless there's some kind of strange factor playing into this Oscars, which by the way, could happen. Hmm. Anything is possible this year. So how well, about you? Well, I, th- I, you know, it's, it's interesting. I do think that Daniel Kaluuya will win also. And I know that people initially had been talking about, oh, will they split the vote? Will there be a certain number of people who or wanting to to give props to Judas and the Black Messiah. And then, you know, some will pick Daniel Kluge and some will pick Lakeith Stanfield, but I don't know if that's necessarily going to be the case. But you're right. I I think that, that we talked about this actually when, when the nominations came out, is that Lakeith Stanfield is an Oscar nominee in the same way that, that Daniel Kluge is, is an Oscar nominee. But I think that I know the the choices that Licky Stanfield's made up until this point. And I know that he's going to have the ability to make some really interesting choices. And I think his ability to take subject matter that is kind of off the wall, whether it be Sorry to Bother You, or I mean, now he's voicing the Black Samurai character from this Netflix animated show. So, I mean, he's he's not stopping in trying to challenge himself and trying to put himself in in different scenarios. So, I'm just totally interested in seeing what he's going to do no matter what. And if he wins an Academy Award, then great. But I I think that just the fact that he's in a conversation, that's awesome. Now, let me just say this, uh, because this is the first category that we're talking about. 
there was an article, and you and I have talked about this off podcast. There was an article about how this year's Oscars might be boring and in the best possible way because there is no major conflict. There is nobody on any of the lists, especially the top five categories, that if they won, you couldn't take it away from them. And for the longest time, the truth of the matter is, Sasha Baron Cohen, I was like, wait, maybe somebody else. Like I had this little disgruntled thing. And now I'm um, 30 minutes left in watching the trial of Chicago seven. And man, he really does do it. He puts in these little nuances that I might not have noticed the first time I saw the film. And so I'm happy to say good for him. If he won, I could, I could be behind it. If any of these five people won, I would be behind it. I just like the fact that Daniel Kaluuya is a two-time Academy Award nominee, and that kind of prompts him into front-runner status. Yeah. And he's won quite a few of the other things, but that's really not a big deal this year because the other precursors are all over the place. I mean, they're all over mm -hmm. the place. Somebody won the BAFTA, somebody won the... Daniel Kaluuya has quietly won quite a yeah. few of them. Uh, but I wouldn't be surprised if something happened. So that said, uh, any five, and without going into a big Hamilton oh, thing, because I have had Hamilton come into my life, finally, and I have a bit of an obsession right now. So Leslie Odom Jr. probably will win best song, so I'm good for him. But if he won for One Night in Miami, you couldn't dispute it. People will debate why Daniel Kaluuya didn't win if somebody else won, but they're never going to say that person didn't mm -hmm. deserve to win. And you could pretty much go down the line all the way through these categories with the yeah. same thing. And maybe that'll get more people to watch Widows, which I think his performance in Widows is just awesome. Stunning. Scary. Next on the list is original screenplay. So for our original screenplay nominees, we've got Emerald Fennell or Fennell, as I've heard some people. What's I, up with that? I, that's I, not I, how you gotta spell Fennell. But everybody keeps saying that. People who I've heard interview her say Fennell. Bo Burnham and Carrie Mulligan all say Emerald oh. Fennell. So they're the okay. stars. I mean, I'll go with Carrie Mulligan and, and Bo Burnham then. So Emerald Fennell for Promising Young Woman, Aaron Sorkin Young up and comer for Trial of Chicago <laughs> Seven. We got Darius Martyr, Derek C. in France, and Abraham Martyr for mm. Sound of Metal, and Shaka King, the Lucas Brothers, and Will Burson for Juice and the Black Messiah, and Lee Isaac Chung for Minari. I'll go first on this one. I think that uh, Emerald Fennell should win for Promising Young Woman. Uh, I also think that that is, seems to be what people are kind of angling for. I, I would be totally happy with Emerald Fennell winning for this. I don't think this is Aaron Sorkin's best script by a long shot. I don't necessarily think the script is the best part of Sound of Metal. And I think that Judas and the Black Messiah and Minari are more movies about scenarios and feelings. And, and yeah, I, I think that Promising Young Woman has a lot more hung on the order of the screenplay. So that's what I'm going to go with. Yeah, I, I agree with you 100%. Uh, Emerald Fennell will win. Emerald Fennell deserves to win. If Aaron Sorkin does win, then we have our best picture uh, winner at yeah. the same time. That's just how it's going to be. Well, you know what? Hollywood is, uh, I, I believe that Promising Young Woman is a movie before its time. I just do. I think that it has acclaim and now accolades and nominations and people are talking about this movie, but I still think it's about 10 years in the future when people will finally go, oh, that's what that was about. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it takes the Academy a while to catch up. Yes, they've nominated Pulp Fiction and it won original screenplay, but it didn't win Best Picture. So in our lifetime, and since we've been doing this podcast, major things have happened with the Academy. That being said, uh, a Korean film uh, subtitled won Best International Film and Best Picture last year. That was kind of unprecedented, too, because like with the awards, I mean, didn't it win like the SAG Ensemble? And it so did. that's the only indicator that it had even a chance at something like Best Picture. Well, if they listened to me, <laughs> that would have been an indicator. Yeah. I am Sir yeah. Indicator. Um, I was fully convinced it was going to happen. And I re-listened to our podcast about that. And I sure enough say, you know what? I'm going for it. Yeah. I'm saying it's winning all four of these Oscars. It should win all six. We'll see what happens. So the, the Academy is catching up. Have they caught up enough to give something like Promising Young Woman its due? I'm not mm. sure. It's a very divisive movie, and it shouldn't be. It should be, if anything, an education. That said, the Academy sometimes 
falls backwards. And if it does, it will be the trial of the Chicago mm. 7. And when that's announced, then we know what the best picture yeah. will be. But for me, after seeing these films a second time, and I probably will see most of them a second time, you said it the best. It's near perfect. When I watched it a second time, I was transfixed by it because there was no moment where I came out of it. None. And everything connects and everything makes sense. And there's a payoff for everything. There's one little glitch, and we can talk about that on our top 10 that I have to ask you about. But yeah, I think Emerald Fennell will be celebrated on Oscar night. And this is how they're going to celebrate mm. her and deservedly so. And I hope that just like you were saying with Lakeith Stanfield, with that little gold statue on their resume, even the nomination, what can they both do next? What will they do next when somebody says, here's a ton of money or what do you want to mm. do? Oh, I want to go direct a play in the West End. Okay. Academy Award winner. So I think it's going to be a good night for Emerald Fennell. Well, next one's going to be Best Adapted Screenplay, Kemp Powers for One Night in Miami. Side note, Kemp Powers also wrote Soul, co-wrote Soul. And so I didn't even put that together when we talked about One Night in Miami that the screenwriter had two films out this year. That's not the first and only time on this list. There are two other people nominated in the same category. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Yeah, we'll get to it. Uh, Florian Zeller and Christopher Hampton for The Father, Chloe Zhao for Nomadland, Maureen Barani for White Tiger, and Sasha Baron Cohen, Nina Pedrad, Jenna Friedman. There's a bunch of people on that list for Borat because I guess they all just got in a room and figured it out. And then I'm not going to say the whole name of Borat, but it's Borat too. Um, The Father will win and The Father should win. I cannot think... Yeah, I can't think of a better adapted screenplay from a play. And we've had this discussion all year long where can you adapt a play to modern day sensibility and it not feel like a play? And we never, during our podcast, we made mention that it was a play before, but we never talked about it being an infringement on our movie going experience. We did talk about that with Ma Rainey. And we did talk about that with One Night in Miami. And with both of those two films, I don't think they overcame that per se. The second, I've actually seen Ma Rainey's Black Bottom almost three times now. And I'm fascinated by actors who have monologues and can pull it off. And it's a film filled with that. But does it rise above its theater roots? I don't Mm -hmm. think it does. Not fully. I can suspend my disbelief, but there's a lot of people who can't. So it doesn't do that, but the father does. And the whole idea behind, and I know this is in the play too, but the whole idea behind the movie for me was not necessarily, and we talked about this, not necessarily seeing somebody with dementia and reacting to them. You're actually in his shoes. You're seeing it from his perspective. And I've never seen that before. And it's handled extremely well. And it has enough stuff in it to make me question what I saw, not necessarily the dementia stuff, but we talked about Paul and the ex-boyfriend James and all those other things that we were a little bit confused Mm -hmm. about. Like, was that real? Did that happen? Did he really slap him? And to me, that leads to a thirst or a hunger for wanting to see it again, because now I need to figure Mm -hmm. it out. And I, I, I think they took an ultimately depressing subject and there were ebbs and flows to that film. And I think it's based on the Mm -hmm. screenplay and the the screenplay doesn't necessarily just mean the words. It has to do with direction and lighting and camera shots and all that other stuff. And in order to do that, they had to figure out how to write in when the scene was going to change and you didn't know it as an audience member, but then you kind of figured it out by a blue plastic bag. And then he was smart enough to write in that that blue plastic bag goes into a pocket. Now I have seen that literally seen something just like that. So I was like, Oh, that's Mm. good. And I'm sure that's in the play, but how they figured it out in the movie, I think was really tough. So I think it, it will Mm. win. That's not taking anything away from anybody else on the list because I think Borat was pretty good too. Uh, everybody kind of had problems with that movie, but I thought it was funny and I thought it was provocative yeah. and I thought it was political and I thought it was dangerous. I laughed and I was grossed out and I liked it better than the first mm. one. So that says a yeah, lot. I think Borat did what it was supposed to do as far as Sasha Baron Cohen was concerned, but it's really difficult to nail that down as a as a script though, because there's a lot of improvisation and, and, and other things going on with that. Now I haven't seen uh, White Tiger. I can't really talk on that, but I would kind of maybe disagree with you on 
the the father. I think that a lot of the choices that probably differentiated the film, at, at least lo- logically for me, it seems like a lot of the choices that differentiated the film from the play would be the choices in direction. And so I, I don't know if the screenplay adaptation. I mean, you're right. It, maybe it's all in there. I, I don't know. It's hard to it's hard to tell. But I think that what Chloe Zhao did in Nomadland is take articles and books and stuff up on this particular subject and kind of like was able to weave in a narrative and still keep the essence of that book and integrate real people and still have a narrative arc for a character. And to me, that seems a lot more difficult. It's kind of like she started with a big, huge chunk of marble and she made a sculpture out of it. And the father to me was more of like a mostly done sculpture that he was able to chop off some stuff and make it look a different way or serve a different function. Well, let me just ask you this. What I find interesting about this conversation is that you, I don't want to say dismissed, but you kind of made a a little comment about Borat saying, I'm not sure about that screenplay because I'm not sure about the improvs and Mm -hmm. blah, 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 throwing in. But What's the difference between that and Nomadland? It's sort of the same thing, right? Except for it's just it's just well, serious. I, it's I, just like yeah. how much did Chloe Zhao write those supporting characters' lines? Did she write those lines? And like is the hippie guy who gives her the lighter, are those lines written? How much of that was improv? To me, it strikes me as the same thing, but because it's about a serious yeah. issue about homelessness, even though it's not homeless. She has a place to live. She just doesn't have a home. So why is that different than what Borat did? For example, like in the scene, the van with the other character and, you know, they're talking back and forth. That's something to where maybe every word is not written out, but just from reading the, about the production of that and about how there was a lot of pre-production that went on where there were producers that would go ahead of the main production team of like the six people that were shooting the, the movie and they would interview people and then they would tape that and then send that to Chloe Zhao. And she would kind of say like, okay, I want to talk to this person. I want to talk to this person. And they would get a kind of like a, we want to start the conversation in point A and we want to end at point B and, that, and this is where we're going. But as far as what you say, okay, we'll deal with that. But then we're, with Borat, I mean, you've literally got two actors going into a cake shop and they don't know what the proprietor of the business is going to say. So they have to react and they have to change. And that makes uh, those scenes dynamic. That makes the, the film dynamic, but it's not necessarily something that you can say that like, all right, we're going to go in and we know exactly what Rudy Giuliani is going to say. We know exactly what he's going to do. It's like, well, you you might have an idea, but you don't really know. So, so you can't say that that's part of the screenplay. No, I agree with what you're saying. I just find it fascinating that people are not that focused on it for uh, a, a serious drama when people and that it's not even really a discussion it's just something that's interesting to me and the reason why borat is an adapted screenplay is because it's based on the first film that's why it's considered yeah. adapted okay uh, i just find it something about it strikes me a little bit more difficult when you know you have to get to certain bullet points in your script and when you walk in with those bullet points, you're right. You don't know what the cake shop owner is going to say. So, But you still have to get back to a certain something you've written in order to make the film work. And I think that was harder to deal with. I think when you write an adapted screenplay and then have to perform it in front of another person who doesn't know you're performing something and you have to improv, but you still have to get back to point A, B, and C in order to connect the dots with the rest of the narrative, I think that's difficult. I 100% understand what you're saying. A lot of those moments are probably funnier because they are improv and those people don't know what's going on. And why doesn't Maria Bakalova get a credit? Yeah, you got a point about that. Well, because I think it's that's after the fact. Anyway, yeah. I think everybody on the list deserves to be mentioned. I, I don't doubt Nomadland could win. Yeah. <laughs> Next one I want to talk about very briefly is uh, Best Achievement in Sound, which is a combination of sound editing and sound design, which nobody ever knew the difference between anyway. So this year they've decided to combine the, the, those two into one. So I think it's a good idea. The nominees are Sound of Metal, Mank, Soul, News of the World, and Greyhound. So I think that Sound of Metal is probably going to win, and I think it should win. I think Mank is amazing. I think what they did in Mank is nothing short of genius, but I think Sound of Metal really leverages 
it, it puts sound first and foremost in the mind of the the viewer and the sound design is inextricably linked to the experience in that film. Yeah, I agree with you. I think that's going to be Sound of Metal's Oscar yeah, for the night. Yeah. I find it fascinatingly ironic that a movie about deaf culture is going to win the sound editing Oscar. And the reason why is because you you don't often get to walk in somebody else's shoes, but movies sometimes allow you to do that. And this movie definitely made it plausible that you understood what it might be like to be in that position because of the sound editing. Yeah. And some of the stuff that they chose to do, like the way that the metal of the slide echoed. I mean, just simple things in that movie. Um, oh, that plane at the end, how the plane flies across the sky and then the sound disappears, mm. but you hear it almost 75% across the sky and it's going from one ear to the next and then it disappears. And it's like, oh, that's clever because they're not just letting you know a sound of an airplane. They're letting you know what a hearing person hears. And I think that's hard how do you, as hearing people, possibly understand the concept behind what it must be like to get those implants or to not get those implants or to be deaf your whole entire life? What would it be like to design sound around that? It was probably challenging as hell. And I think they pulled yeah. it off because it is, it's an emotional reaction to the sound editing that mm -hmm. I had. Especially the singing scene at, at the end. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, tough. Even all the way at the beginning well, yeah. with the way that their band, drummer and singer, if you will, um, or drummer, guitar player, singer, the way it sounded in a club really sounded like it was in a club. And then when he goes outside and you hear that cliche door shut and then you hear that uh, muffled sound of inside, that's not the important part. The important part is he's hearing it a different way right now because of that buzzing that they they put in there. It's, it's really well done. It'll be a well-deserved Oscar. Mm -hmm. Okay, so next is cinematography, and I just got in under the wire. I've seen all of films nominated for cinematography now. Uh, I've got Eric Messerschmidt for Mank, Sean Bobbitt for Judas and the Black Messiah, Fidon Papa Michael for Trial of the Chicago 7, Joshua James Richards for Nomadland, and Darius Wolski for News of the World. I will use this opportunity, since we may not talk about News of the World again for a while, to say that News of the World stars. Tom Hanks, and it's got a Tom Hanks moment in it. Mm. And now I'm scared of it. No, no, oh, no. no I mean, scared. it was worth watching, and it's such a, and it's not, it's not a prolonged Captain Phillips, which is uh, that's where we got this from. Is that scene at the end of Captain Phillips, which was directed by Paul Greengrass. He also directed this film, so it was interesting to see how Greengrass knows. It seems like Greengrass knows he can get that. And I don't know how many takes they did or whatever. It could have been the first take, probably was the first take, but it was this, it's this look to where you're like, oh, I know exactly what is going on in his brain and I'm feeling it. And that, that's tough to do. I couldn't imagine transmitting that emotion without, you're not like arching your eyebrows and you're not quivering your lip and you're not tearing up. Like he didn't do any of that, but I still felt it all. So it's graduated from a Captain Phillips moment to a Tom Hanks moment. Oh, now. now it is. Yeah, I'm fine with that. Now I'm not, I, I, I kid myself when I say I'm scared of it, but I am, I, I have to tread lightly because that stuff zings me all the time. Yeah. So if it got you, mm. oh man, Oof. I'll be self-flagellating afterwards. <laughs> oh, <laughs> asking for forgiveness from the emotional. Jeez, no, it was it was good. All right, so I think that Joshua James Richards will win for Nomadland, and I think he should, even though I really love Mank. I'm going to say that a lot, all night. I love Mank. I really love Mank. But the choices that he and Chloe Zhao made uh, in Nomad Land, I think that they were very specific about t certain times of day that they shot, and and there were some amazing shots that were not actually, and that was one of the detriments of News of the World. I think that there were a lot of kind of like shots in News of the World that just looked kind of rough to me, and it took me out of the film as far as bolstering certain landscapes with CGI that I could notice. So yeah, that was a, a little rough. And I think of of the rest of them, it would be a runoff from Nomad Land and Mank, and I think that. Nomadland, the cinematography adds more to the film than I think it does in Mank. I agree with you. I think uh, Nomad 
Land will win, and I think it deserves to win. It's a second or third character in the movie. Mm. The cinematography is a character in the movie. And I can't remember if Brokeback Mountain won cinematography. I think it Mm. did. Don't quote me on that, though. I think it won adapted screenplay, director, and cinematography. Right, it won director, didn't it? Jeez. Yes, it did. Deservedly so. Deservedly so. But not picture. (laughs) But not picture, yeah. Uh, It won score, but it was nominated for cinematography. Rodrigo Prieto, okay. Okay. who's worked with Scorsese, and he's... Yeah, beautiful yeah. movie. It's another character in the film. And once again, that's a prime example of what I was talking about earlier with Promising Young Woman. It takes 10 or so years for the rest of the world to catch up, Hollywood to catch up to films now. And Brokeback Mountain is not talked about... It, it, it's not talked about the fact that it lost the Oscar. It's the fact that it lost the Oscar to crash, and how could that happen? Yeah. And it's the number one, like biggest wrong decision that the Academy has ever made. Mm. I didn't mind Crash. I liked it when I saw it. It doesn't call to me. I've seen it a second time. I've seen Brokeback Mountain a handful of times. Mm -hmm. And that movie just sings. And it should have won score now that I think about it. But Nomadland is the same thing on some level. And it might have to do with Midwest scenery and that kind of stuff. Or the silence of the film. What's it called? The Magic Hour? That could be overdone. And it could be, it could inhibit the film. And it doesn't. The other thing that I think that the cinematographer does that I find interesting and watching it a second time, and I've only seen bits and pieces of it a second time, I noticed things that, and this might be Chloe Zhao as much as the cinematographer, but seeing inside that van must have been difficult. Figuring out how to light inside that van when everything was shut. And there's a scene in the beginning of the film, and you know instantaneously it's Christmas time because in the background is a little Santa Claus lamp. And it's never mentioned. And then a little bit further on in the film, she's singing a Christmas song and you figure out it's Christmas time, but it's just subtly there. And the way that it looks, it glows in a way that makes your eye go to it, but doesn't distract from what you're supposed to be watching the actress do. And I think that's the cinematography, because I think if that was too bright or too dark, you wouldn't get the idea. It wouldn't color the the scene as something happening at Christmas time. And I think it's something that went by so quickly that it registered on some kind of subconscious level. And that has to do with lighting. And that's the cinematography. So I think Mank is going to do better than we expect it to do. Mm. Hopefully. (laughs) I just said that. And then I just saw a vision of it not winning anything. Oh, that's Um, David Fincher's curse. Oh, it is not. It is not. Would you stop it with that? (laughs) David Fincher has won Oscars for people in the past. Of course he has. So it has happened. Yeah, of course he has. Always a bridesmaid. So, but I think that at one point you were saying that he probably would never be nominated. So that's, that's come true. to pass. So the good thing is he doesn't care. Like I seriously think he doesn't care. Oh yeah, why yeah. would you? Why you're one of the best American directors of all time yeah. at this point. You have your thumbprint is part of our souls. So I'll take that over an accolade any day. So he doesn't yeah. care. But until he wins, <laughs> until he wins, and then he'll be like, oh. Well, maybe I take back all that cynicism, you know? (laughs) I don't know what he says about the Oscars. I've never heard him say a bad word. That said, side note, really quick. If his father was nominated for original screenplay, that's who I would have voted for, Hmm. just because. And surprisingly that it's not. But, you know, that's a whole other subject. All right, next is Best Supporting Actress. You've got uh, Yeon Yoo Jung for Minari, Olivia Coleman for The Father, Amanda Seyfried for... Mank, Maria Bakalova for Borat, and Glenn Close for Hillbilly. It seems like Yeon Yu will win, and I think that would be awesome if she did. Amanda Safe that she did a serious job, and, and I think that that is definition of a supporting actress. Both of those performances are definition of a supporting actress. Um, and yeah, I guess you're going to have to talk me into Olivia Coleman if, you're, if you think she should win, but for me olivia coleman is like what do they call them it's like it's yeoman just like she's like what do you want me to carry all right I'll you said that on the podcast about the father that she just always gets on base and i'm like she always gets on base it shouldn't be ah she always gets on base you're right she always gets on base and she takes your soul and your heart and rips it out throws it back in and you're like a better person for it mm-hmm. just from a flicker of an eye and so I'm not going to talk you into it because I don't think she's going to win, but I'm glad that she's nominated again because I think it's a nominatable performance. And this, and I don't want to spend any negative time on things, but I do have to be truthful and say that I would venture to say 
that I could be called out on saying there's not a nominated performance that shouldn't win. And I hate to say it, but I think Glenn Close might fall into that category. Although I love her, I predicted that uh, she wasn't going to be nominated and that she wasn't going to win. And it's not that I want to stick to that. I just am perplexed by that movie. And I can't foresee myself watching it again anytime soon, unless it's on and somebody else wants to watch it, then I'll like, I'll, I'll probably watch it. And I'm hoping that I see something in that performance that changes my mind. But for me, I just don't see it. I just don't understand why people are putting so much energy behind that. Maybe because it's going close and that's fine. But I also feel bad for her too, because this is like her eighth nomination. And if you're going to give somebody a nomination, in my opinion, I think it should be you're giving somebody a nomination because you think they have the potential to win. And it doesn't feel that way to me. It feels like they gave her the nomination because she's Glenn Close. And I'm like, she's going to sit there in the audience again and not win. I mean, who knows? She could win. I mean, people love her. But I'll stick to what I said on the podcast. If she does win, in the back of my mind, I will think to myself, I wish it wasn't for this. Yeah. I wish it was for Fatal Attraction. I wish that's the truth of the matter. I will say this. I have sometimes gone back and watched performances later on after I've come out of Oscar and all that other stuff and seen why they have the value in them that they got the accolade nomination. So maybe that will happen with that. I'm trying to find the positive in this because I can't see it happening. That said, I think Yoon Yu Chung. I think she's going to win. I think she deserves to win. She's masterful. There's nothing like her performance in that category. That scene, spoiler, doesn't matter really, but spoiler, that scene when she's walking down the road at the end of Minari and she's lost and she's had a stroke and she can't. And then that scene where she's watching them sleep, it's like, ugh. And she's won a lot of the other awards. That said, this category has been all over the place, so it could go to any of them. So I think she will win. Mm. All right. So the next category is best editing. We got Sound of Metal, Promising Young Woman, The Father, Trial of the Chicago 7, and Nomadland. What do you think? Trial of the Chicago 7. I think it's going to set a precedent and I think it's going to lead us down the the line of what's going to win best picture. That's sad. I, I, like I said, well, I mean, it's not, it's, it's done pretty well. I, it, you it, just said I it's done see- pretty well. We've got Promising Young Woman and The Father just sitting there. And, fair enough. And, and both of it's them, fair enough. I mean, editing is such an important part of both of those films. It, they do not work without the editing. Okay. And Trials Chicago 7 would work with, with worse editing. Well, hold on a second. We're not talking about what my pick is. Okay. We're talking about what will win. And so mm. being an Oscar fanatic, yep. well, not fanatic, huge fan of the Oscars, I can sort of see things based on past history. And the trial of Chicago 7 feels like a comfortable fit for the Academy. So will it win original screen or original screenplay? I don't think it should, but it could. I don't know. But should it win is a whole nother subject. But it is a comfortable fit for the Academy. So if it does win these Oscars, and you have to remember, Bohemian Rhapsody won all four of the Oscars that it was nominated for, one of which being edited. And so I don't personally understand enough about that um, subject or that job editing. All I can tell you is how I feel when I'm watching a movie. And for me, Trial of Chicago 7 smells like an Academy Award winning editing film Oscar. It just does. For me personally, the editing and sound of metal made my soul filled and then crushed and the way that those drums are being edited in the beginning and the way that whole concert's being edited in the beginning is amazing. And then how simple the scene between Paul Racy and Riz Ahmed later on, the scene with Paul Racy, the way it's edited could have been so overdone back forth, back forth, but it's not. It's done exactly the way that it should be done. Now, I don't know what that means technologically speaking. All I can say is how I felt. When I was facing Paul Racy, I should have been facing Paul Racy. Mm. When I was facing Riz Ahmed, I was facing Riz Ahmed. And that's editing. Mm. And the way that that scene is shot, and this has a lot to do with the director too, and we talked about this, with that screen where Paul Racy's words are going across the computer screen because they have that thing set up, that could have been overbearing. And I think the way that it's shot and the way that it's edited allows a human, because I do consider myself human, it allows you to take everything in emotionally, and that's hard to do. So should Sound of Metal win the editing Oscar? It filled my soul, so yes. 
But is the academy progressed enough to, to see that maybe that's a qualification too? And also, I don't work in a film editing world. I have no idea what qualifies somebody as a film editor, good, bad, or indifferent. I can only tell you what I felt during the movie. And you got a little smirk on your face because you're a broadcast engineer in a good way. So you do have some practical experience. So, Well, I think that maybe that's the issue is that isn't the bulk of the the academy actors and actresses? No. No? Oh, okay. But do, but uh, does everybody vote on all of these nominees? I can never remember how it okay. works. I know there's committees for the documentaries. I think uh, the film editing uh, union votes for film editors. Sure. And then everybody, and then everybody votes. votes, votes e exactly. For so these five are what the editors think should be there. But then once th it's the Wild West at this point. So anybody who... <laughs> A, a costume designer is going to be like, that's definitely edited better. So, and, and they very well may know more about film editing than I do, but I feel like, I mean, for me, Promising Young Woman is something that was edited to within an inch of its life in a good way. And I assumed that the Academy would look at something like the father and be like, this is a good example of editing. So I assumed that the father would be the one to win. Well, it's in the, it's in the conversation. Uh, promising young woman is in the conversation all the way down the line. Yeah. So I don't, I don't count it out. Uh, international feature film. This could be a very short conversation. I've only seen one of these. Have you seen more than? No, I've only seen one. And two. So it's another round. Is the one that we've obviously both yeah. talked about and seen. And is that the one that is slated to? You know, I honestly oh, don't okay. know. I don't know enough. Yeah, I don't know enough about this category this year to even have a conversation about it. To be honest with you. I know this much. That category is hard for me to catch up on during the year. Yeah. But I will eventually fall into have I will have seen the majority of those nominees by this time two years from now. Nice. I they just come into my life. I just don't seek them out as much. If I was living in LA or New York and they were playing somewhere and I could go to the actual theater and see them, I would definitely pursue all of that. But it's not something even in the streaming world that we live in yeah. that i seek out yeah i will though yeah all right next original score so we've got this is what you were talking about okay yep where you've got terrence blanchard for the five bloods trent reznor and atticus ross for mank and then you add john batiste in there with those two guys for soul and then Emil Morseri for Minari and James Newton Howard for News of the World. The score for News of the World was not anything to write home about, although I do love James Newton Howard. His score for Signs is just awesome, the In Light Shyamalan movie, and I do listen to that every once in a while. I think that Soul will win, but I would kind of love it for Mank to win this. Terrence Blanchard's score for The Five Bloods was really awesome. And I know a lot of people are talking about Emil Morseri and his score for Minari, but I, I would say that would be fourth for me. You know, I'm not counting out Mank about anything. I'm just not. Um, but Soul is taking over the world. And so I think that will win. But I think Terrence Blanchard should win because Defy Bloods only has one nomination. Yeah. And I'm fully 100% behind that movie. And I have not mentioned anything else at this point about like putting somebody else in the category that didn't get nominated because there's a bunch of them. And we'll leave that alone. So, and also, I just listened to the whole soundtrack, which I hardly ever do, but it's, it's on YouTube. Uh, you know, it's song by song. You have to, you know, listen to commercials and stuff like that, but that's okay. And, you know, with my earbuds, my modern technology, it's fascinating because you know what's really great about the five bloods soundtrack or score. Um, score thank you is that it's a very atypical movie score with all of this stuff blended into it you know the very first uh song is so, it's so identifiable as a a score a movie score that even if you popped it on and never seen the movie you would know it was from a movie but then all of these strange things happen. There's this, I believe, Vietnam influence in the tones. And there are rhythms that are out of step with other things, but really work for the movie. Mm. And there's a pulsating beat to that score that maybe because I'm so in love with that movie and I think that movie got overlooked mm -hmm. and that this guy is nominated. So I'm all about that. He's my only 
chance. You know, this is the, this is our only hope. But it's really on point when it comes to scores. It really, really is. But I can well, see the Minari it, score winning too. Mm. And, and, you know, Terrence Blanchard's worked with Spike Lee a bunch in the past. I think we even talked about his score for Black Klansman. But I think that he does a good job of juxtaposing the action on screen uh, a lot. And I just finished watching Bamboozled over the weekend because we're getting ready for our 300th episode, which is going to be all about Spike Lee. So I'm trying to catch up on some Spike Lee films that I haven't seen before. And he does that in that film too, where it's kind of juxtaposing what's on screen, but it does fit somehow. Like, I think that is, that's really interesting. Whereas there's an easy answer or, or an easy choice for a score or for, for anything really. I mean, and, but that's not the things that people talk about. They don't talk about what, whether it's the, you know, the easy action shot for, you know, a, a movie. They talk about the, the crazy action shots. It's not the easy choice for, for a performance of an actor. It's it's the more interesting, out there, difficult things that, that people end up speaking about a lot. So it's, it's, I mean, it would be really cool if Terrence Blanchard won, but Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross, I mean, you got the guy from Nine Inch Nails writing two jazz scores. I mean, co- collaborating on two jazz scores, essentially. And that's just kind of amazing. And it works. That's the thing that's amazing to me. It's like, he is and a musician. And they have Oscars already. Yeah, they are musicians. And they are, you know, they're, they're like, they're showing up to play, you know? So I think that's, that's really awesome. I say that, and Terrence Blanchard is an amazing jazz performer and composer in his own right, separate from all of his work with Spike Lee. All right, next, best director. So you got David Fincher for Mank, Chloe Zhao for Nomadland, Emerald Fennell for Promising Young Woman, Lee Isaac Chung for Minari, and Thomas Vinterberg for Another Round. Uh, It's a great category, first of all. It's not a stinker in the bunch. And all five of those films are crafted because of those directors. So it's almost a foregone conclusion and I said two locks when we were talking about Daniel Kaluuya, and I believe Chloe Zhao is the second lock, if not the only lock. She's won everything. And that's not necessarily a reason to give her an Oscar, but that beautiful, simple, elegant movie is the reason to give her the Oscar. It's mm-hmm. a beautiful film, and it's crafted that way because of her. And I love the fact that she's going to make history. She'll be the second woman first woman of color and not that that's like a big deal for me but it does set set a precedence and we talked about this when we talked about nomad land does this mean that when chloe Zhao goes into a an executive office that they'll give her money for a project she wants to work on yes that's exactly what this means i don't know how the immortals eternal is going to do eternals jesus i can't get nothing right okay that big marvel film that she's working on i don't know how well what is it eternals <laughs> What am I wearing an Immortals from? Okay. That's a that's a Henry Cavill movie, which was really horrible. It was like in, in the Roman God days or whatever. Oh, yeah. I just saw a clip of that. Okay. I don't know how well the Eternals are going to do, but I can't imagine it not being a big picture. But this is what's going to set the precedence for her career in Hollywood, her winning Best Director. That said, I would vote for Emerald Fennell because how hard was it to put together Promising Young Woman? And the tone and the sophisticated attitude about it is all in her hands. And it was really hard to do. And you come out of that movie, Bill Maher made a big deal about how these are all cry, cry, sob, sob films. Can't Hollywood put out a happy film and it be nominated for Best Picture? So be it. You're allowed your opinion. You got your own HBO show. That said, I felt uplifted after Nomadland. I felt uplifted after Minari. I didn't necessarily feel uplifted after Promising Young Woman, but I did feel a sense of satisfaction. And we talked about this during the podcast, the way that she shoots certain scenes. She's got Carrie Mulligan in the center frame with that halo behind her. And we've since come to find out that the bed is designed to make it look like she has wings Mm. and she's perfectly in the center of that. And you know, I love when they center things. I love that. Like it drives me crazy when there's something just a little off on the right-hand side. Like my eye goes, so it's like, bitch it over. But it's the colors and the ideas and the structure of Promising Young Woman. I really think in the future, now I'm trying to stay away from hyperbolic statements because I have realized since we talked about that, that 
I am the hyperbolic statement guy. <laughs> I really think that it's going to be considered, I would venture to say, a masterpiece because her tone, the tone that Emerald Fennell found in her directing. So I'm perfectly happy with Chloe Zhao, but I would vote for Emerald Fennell. Yeah, I, I mean, I agree with all that you said. And the only thing else I will say is that I'm glad that we got to see a Thomas Fincherberg movie. I've heard of him before. And I'm glad that, you know, this nomination and the international film nomination pushed us into the movie and it was great. And then same thing with uh, Lee Isaac Chung, seeing his mastery, actually, it, as a director, it was, was great. And then with David Fincher, I mean, he's a known quantity for me and I'm kind of protective of like saying that I want even want him to win. Uh, the best director for this movie because he's made, I feel like he's made better films that he should have been awarded for. And I kind of am hoping that there's a film out there that, that he has yet to make that will push him to the top of everyone's list. So I don't want it to be a, a pity award. Whereas I think that I'm, I'm not saying that Emerald Fennell won't make a better movie than Promising Young Woman, but I'm saying it would be difficult for anybody to do that considering what she showed in, in that film. So yeah, I'm I'm hopeful that she will make a, a, a better movie. It's I I'm getting like a ooh, geez, talk about hyperbolic. I'm getting a Paul Thomas Anderson vibe because it's someone who has a clear vision of what they want and is uncompromising. And I don't feel like she pulled any punches with this movie. And she found a way to make it and the people to make it with. And and so you could look at something like, I mean, Hardy to a certain extent, but you could look at something like Boogie Nights and be like, all right, well, I mean, he can hang it up because that was a great film and why even try? And then he makes the master, you know, and it's kind of like, oh, well, didn't know he had that in him, you know, or even Punch Drunk Love. It's like for every... Any of the above yeah, after on. Boogie Nights. Exactly. I was sitting there thinking a ton of different things. You came up with the two ones I wasn't thinking of. <laughs> so, but yeah. So yeah, for every for every Boogie Nights, you get these other five films. You know, it's like so that's that's what I'm excited about. I'm excited about Emerald Fennell's next five films. Well, this is how I feel about her. At least this is an instinct that I have. I don't think she's going to make a movie unless she can invest herself in it like she did for Promising Young Woman. I don't think mm. she's out to just make the next film. Uh, I'm sure she's being flooded by scripts. I'm sure she's being offered acting jobs, all of which she should get. But I don't think she's going to make a movie just to make a movie. Mm. I don't think that she can be talked into making a movie. Oh, this is good for your career. I don't see that or sense that about her on any level. Not that that's bad. If you want to be a Hollywood director the rest of your life, you're going to have to take on projects that might not be 100% you're behind at first, but then you you take it on and you 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 fall in love with it. She doesn't strike me as that person. She's like, I'm going to do this movie in five years after I can figure out how this is going to work. And then I'll go and do conventions with the crown and just sign pictures until I can make the money to do this. But yeah, yeah it's a, a fascinating year with two women being nominated. That's not even a glass ceiling. That's a glass house, a glass country, a glass planet being shattered. Mm. And, and, and two women directing such diverse films and such interesting worlds they brought us into. Yeah. They brought us into only that world that they could have directed. And so it's not like a handout. You know, like you're saying with Mank, I, I, I have a little bit of a disagreement with you about, I think Mank's up there when it comes to what Fincher has done. And in any other year without, you know, Minari, without Promising Young Woman, without The Trial of the Chicago, without these films, Mank would be like winning all 10 yeah. because it, it's a superb film. But because it hasn't taken on the life of uh, being the front runner for anything, everybody's like, why does Hollywood hate David Fincher's movie? It doesn't hate David Fincher's no. movie. It was nominated for 10 Oscars, yeah. 10 of which it deserved to be nominated for. And I'm not counting it out for anything, mm -hmm. but I just, I feel mm -hmm. like it's not that David Fincher doesn't deserve it. It's just that Chloe Zhao or... Emerald Fennell deserves it just that much more. I don't even know if you can quantify things like that or qualify things, whatever the right word is for that. Mm -hmm. I don't even know if you can do that mm -hmm. because you can't compare work, but he stacks up. It's one of the best movies of the year. I yeah. don't care what anybody says. I'll fight anybody over that. <laughs>
<laughs> All right. So next is uh, actor in a leading role. So we've got Anthony Hopkins for The Father, Chadwick Boseman for Ma Rainey's Black Bottom, Riz Ahmed for Sound of Metal, Gary Oldman for Mank, Stephen Young for Minari, and this one is not a lock for you. That is interesting. So that didn't fall into the category of a lock for you. Do you think Chadwick Boseman's going to win it? Yes. Okay. But there's a possibility of Anthony Hopkins? Yes. Interesting. I'd be happy yes. with either of those. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, and if somebody was a dark horse surprise, so be it. So be it. Because all three of the other ones deserve it too. Yeah. When it does happen and people look back on it, they go, of course, that's the person who should have won. <laughs> of course it is. Marion Coltier for mm. playing Edith Piaf. Of course she should have won. But nobody was predicting that to begin with, except for the guy who does our music, Chad Goodman. We were watching the Oscars together that year. The clip of Edith Piaf came on, we watched it, and then the uh, you saw Marion Coltier's face, and he goes, wait, that's her? That That's the same person? She's winning the Oscar. And I was like, from your lips to God's ear to the Oscar envelope. And sure enough, <laughs> that's exactly what ended up happening. So I think he's the only one who foresaw it. Wow. Although she did win some precursors, mm. and there was some rumbling about her winning. But that was really the year that um, Ellen Page and... Julie Christie were going neck and neck oh. for the precursors. And I was hoping Marianne Coltier would win. So it can happen. It can happen. Will it happen in this category? Probably not. Chadwick Boseman probably will win. And I'm cool with that. I just rewatched that again, like I said. And he's really great. I mean, he <laughs> just, you know what I like the best about his performance? There's that monologue that he has that's incredible. Mm -hmm. But I like the whole, like, I want to be more than the court jester thing he's got. He's got a, a pep in his step and there's a life to that character that has this energy that I, I don't know if I noticed the first time. And it is the polar opposite of Ma Rainey's energy. Mm -hmm. She's laid back and waving her fan because she's sweating and she needs her Coca-Cola. And she's got this like, this is the way it's going to be. And he's all like, bah, 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 bah. and I just never noticed the first time I saw it, how much their energy was in opposition of each other. Mm. And so will he win? Probably. But my heart is with Anthony Hopkins. And I'm not going to be embarrassed to say that because I don't want it to be anything other than that performance in The Father touched my soul. Mm -hmm. And there should be no blowback about why I picked Anthony Hopkins, but there could be if he won. And that should not happen. Because anybody who's seen both movies cannot be upset if Anthony Hopkins wins and cannot be upset if Chadwick Boseman wins, mm -hmm. if they're Anthony Hopkins fans. They just can't be. Well, I, I think- There we go. Yeah. the So it's difficult because we've talked about multiple times where, where getting an award can be a, a stepping stone or can be an arrow in your quiver for something that's going to happen in the future or something like a chip that you can cash in or it, it gives you some sort of cachet or-, or it gives you an opportunity that you wouldn't have had. Whereas in this case, what it's looking like is that this is going to be a posthumous Oscar, which is not the first time this has happened before. And I'm sure it will not be the last, but it's more of like a memorial or an honorarium for the work of this actor, in this case, of his life. And for all that he went through without anybody even knowing it, like that that's just the amazing part. He had such strength and such fortitude and he cared about all the other people around him that he was willing and able to take on the burden of the knowledge and the pain and all the stuff they did to go through by himself, or at least with his, you know, core group of people that were very close to him. So, I mean, that is something that should be honored. But in the same way, this award, it's like it's serving two different functions for the people who are uh, still alive. It, it can be something that is going to help them in their future. But in, in this case... It, it will potentially just be a memorial. So it puts the voters in a, in a tough position to where just, you know, if you do vote for Anthony Hopkins, it doesn't mean that you don't appreciate what Chadwick Boseman did in this role and what he's done in his career up to the point where he passed away. Well, you know, we're human beings. We have our flaws and we bring our own sensibility to things like this. So if you're voting for somebody because you loved Black Panther and you, you know, forgot about Silence of the Lambs, then that's just a human way to do it. That said, the question should be, would they still vote for him if he was alive? And I think the answer is yes. Oh. And I think the performance, and the second thing for yeah. that is, is even though he's passed away, 
the performance is on the screen. So you can't really fight that. You yeah. can't really discuss that because it is on the screen. I choked up the first time I saw Ma, Ma Rainey's Black Bottom when he does what he does at the end of the film. That choked me up when um, he was given the producer the songs yeah. or oh. the owner of the studio. Yeah, that crushed well, That's me. the moment that he loses faith, that he loses yeah. hope. Yeah. So you, like you were saying earlier, Ma Rainey is just like, is like she's hunkered down in her feelings and in her emotions and in her life situation because essentially she's lost hope. <laughs> and and he hasn't lost hope yet and we get to see him lose yeah. hope on screen yeah and, and so that said can i really be objective about the father considering i have personal experience yeah. can i can i be objective and is it wrong to bring that subjectiveness to voting for somebody for the oscar i think it's all fair yeah. and one, once it's all said and done i don't think people are going to look back on chadwick boseman winning the oscar as because he died and yeah. people felt sympathetic for that the performance is on the screen, and I think he would have been celebrated this way in life. Do I think that the category would be more competitive at this point? Maybe. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you have the Black Panther finally being nominated for an Oscar, yeah. and you want to give <laughs> the King of Wakanda his prize. You <laughs> just do. So I think that might have played into it much more if he yeah. was alive than the fact that he had died, you know? So who cares at this point? It's on the screen. You know what I mean? Yeah, and and I think that's the one thing it will it will do is it will lionize that performance and it will also lionize him as an actor to the point where when you Google Academy Award winning actors, he's going to show up. So then people can can go back and see some of his other roles. So, yeah. Well, you cool. know, it's interesting that we talk about because he's passed away, is this the reason why? You know what my mind does? My mind does not think that way. What I think is all of the performances were not going to get. Exactly. That's where my heart and soul goes. And so I'm just glad that we've got the five bloods because there was a possibility he was going to be nominated twice this year. Mm -hmm. And so be it. And that we have Ma Rainey's Black Bottom and we have that character on screen forever now. So it saddens me that we don't get to see anything else from this person. And we've got years and years, hopefully, of performances from Riz Ahmed, Stephen Young, hopefully Gary Oldman and Anthony Hopkins too. I'm, I'm really talking myself into voting for Chadwick Boseman because, you know, <laughs> but anyway, so I see it though. I, I see it now just in talking through this. I understand that there's a direct line to to that kind of a vote, whether it's for Chadwick Boseman or for Peter Finch or for Heath Ledger or whoever. All right. So best actress, we've got Carrie Mulligan for Promising Young Woman, Viola Davis for Ma Rainey's Black Bottom, Frances McDormand for Nomadland, Andre Day for United States versus Billy Holiday, and Vanessa Kirby for Pieces of a Woman. I'm tired just thinking about those performances. After you just named them, I'm like, I'm exhausted. I'm emotionally drained just hearing their names. Uh, <laughs> there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff going on. I guess Viola Davis is gonna win, but I watched United States versus Billy Holiday last night, and Andre Day, she goes there. All mm -hmm. of the theirs. So, yes, she does. And it's her first real performance. <laughs> best way to put that. I said that she was emotionally and physically exposed. She is devastating in that movie. Devastating. And you're right. Sorry to interrupt you. It is her first movie. Crazy. Not fair. Yeah. Not fair. Yeah. And I did a little bit of research on her to, to the point where it's like she was doing like YouTube videos 10 years ago. It's amazing. That performance, I don't know. Maybe I'm too close to it. And I'm definitely a... Kerry Mulligan Stan or whatever the kids call it, but I <laughs> I would have no problem with Kerry Mulligan winning the Best Actress Award. And then, I mean, Viola Davis is Viola Davis. So, I mean, I haven't seen uh, Pieces of a Woman and then Frances McDormand. Her, her performance was great, but I think it's a lot more subtle than the other performances in this category. And so it's hard for me as a non-actor to really evaluate properly, I think, her performance based on all the other performances in this list. It's the most interesting best actress race I've ever seen in my life. Wow. And that's not hyperbolic. That's the facts. Remember when I texted you that I think that Olivia Coleman and Glenn Close are going to go neck and neck with awards. One's going to win the Golden Globe. Well, I ended up being completely wrong about that. But 
not when it came to best actress. That's exactly how it goes. Is it Andra or Andra? I don't know. I'm saying I, Andra Day. I haven't. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I've heard it pronounced both ways. So we'll go with Andra. It sounds more like an Academy Award winning person's name, but hopefully it's not Andra. And then I just insulted her. <laughs> anyway, she won the Golden Globe and Frances McDormand has won the BAFTA and other stuff. And then Viola Davis just won the Screen Actors Guild, which was not supposed to happen according to everybody else talking about it. But Anthony Hopkins wasn't supposed to win the BAFTA. That said, Carrie Mulligan it wasn't able to compete in that category because of some rule change. I don't know. There's some weird thing with the BAFTAs. It's not that she wasn't nominated, but there was a weird rule change where she wasn't eligible, she's which British. I don't really, well, that and well, Olivia Coleman wasn't nominated for the BAFTA for supporting actress. Huh. What is going on with the BAFTAs? But that said, Dominic Fishback was nominated. So mm. I'm going to give him credit. This is the hardest category to predict. Here's why all five of them could win it. All five of them would deserve it. Vanessa Kirby is the dark horse. It's a possibility. It just is. At this point, there is nothing, nothing that is out of the realm of possibilities. That said, I think Carrie Mulligan will win. I think she's going to be the surprise win for the night. I think she deserves to win. I think she, even though Frances McDormand's performance is subtle, that doesn't subtract her out of the equation for me because I think a subtle performance is as difficult as an over-the-top performance. Andre Day is amazing. I mean, she's amazing. So who knows at this point? So Carrie Mulligan will win, but I would vote for Vanessa Kirby. Here's why. One, she's the dark horse. She's what they consider the fifth nomination. She's not won anything up to this point that I know of. And to me, I like the underdog. And her performance is devastating. It is devastating. And it's not necessarily situationally devastating because of what happens in the beginning of the film doesn't make her character devastating. That's the word I'll use. It's all of the subtle little things that she does in that film. And I know you haven't seen it yet. You, you might not. Um, because it's a tough movie, but she overcame controversy, not her controversy, another actor's controversy in that film. She overcame semi not great reviews for that movie, but she has never been talked about other than Oscar nominatable and she deserves to be. So I don't know how many people would vote for her. And I know that that's a wonky reason to vote for somebody, but I'm voting for her because I want people to vote for her because she deserves to win just like anybody else, not mm -hmm. in the conversation of other accolades. That's just not where she's at in this. But if she does win, let me tell you, if she does win, what will be discussed the next couple of weeks is, of course, she should have won. Did you <laughs> see that? She's devastating in that. That's what they'll be talking about. Yeah. So it's going to be an interesting thing because it was almost seeming like Frances McDormand was a lock. And then all of a sudden, Viola Davis won the SAG and people are like, wait what? But you can't argue it because she's great. And the great thing about her performance in Ma Rainey's Black Bottom, other than just everything about it, is that it sets a precedence for an uncommon character to be nominated for the Oscar. You don't see very many people who are confident and secure. And the way she walks through that hotel lobby in the beginning, the way she flips her hat on, she is, you said it the best, she's lost her hope, but she's still living her life. And she's still a solid, strong person. She talks about it and there are situational things that are making her life difficult, but that's not what the character's about. And usually it's about something other than that in certain movies. So anyway, it's just nice to see a strong woman character be nominated and being, I wouldn't say there is a front runner because there's a, really a five-legged race here, mm -hmm. but she just pulls out a little bit and then all of a sudden Carrie Mulligan wins something and all of a sudden Vanessa Kirby's in there and it's like, wait, what's happening here? So that said, whoever wins will deserve it and there's not a stinker in the bunch. All right. Well, last but not least, we've got Best Picture. So there's Sound of Metal, Mank, Promising Young Woman, Minari, The Father, Judas and the Black Messiah, Trial of the Chicago 7, and Nomadland. I think Nomadland will win, and I think it would be awesome if Promising Young Woman won. 
but that is almost assuredly not going to happen. I would agree with you uh, with that definitive statement if it wasn't this year. I don't think anything is out of the realm of possibility this year. I think we said the same exact thing about Parasite last year, actually, now that I'm thinking of it. like What did we say? I would like Parasite to win, but that is almost assuredly not going to happen. That's what you said. <laughs> okay. That's not what I said. That's true. No, well, no, I, you're right. I, you're right. I, I went, I went back and re- I listened There's to it. There's no way I would have said Parasite could win because I just would not have would not have thought that was possible. How long have you known me? Give give yourself over to the power, the power of the Paul, <laughs> <laughs> the power of the Oscar Paul. Um, here's the thing: I did say last year Parasite will win Best Picture, but I will be okay if 1917 wins. That's mm-hmm. what I said. I will be okay with it, but I'm really having a hard time saying that because I think and know Parasite will win, and then. Now we're history. Okay, so don't be mad at me. Don't be mad at me. Um, Because the eight nominees for Best Picture are great. There's not a stinker in the bunch. There's not anybody I would take it away from. It's fine. Trials Chicago 7 is, comparatively speaking, not as great for me. Now, once I get through it a second time, I will see. So far, I've really enjoyed it a second time. So far, I'm gelling on it. So, So far, it's making more sense to me than the first time I saw it. The humor is intact. There's like, really, he says to Abby Hoffman, Abby, you're getting on my nerves. That one, <laughs> one guy says when he's humming, when they're trying to get Tom Hayden out of jail mm. and Abby Hoffman is, oh, 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 oh. and then when they deescalate that, he turns to me and goes, Abby, you get on my nerves. You know, it's, that's funny for a hippie to say that to Abby Hoffman. It's funny. So there's a lot of good things going on in that film. That said, I think it will win best picture. Here's why. It is the easiest one for the academy to vote for it makes sense i'm not saying that's a good thing or a bad thing and i'm not judging them for that but it is an academy award winning picture on paper like it just ha- it has an epically big cast everybody is stupendous in it it has a best supporting actor nomination it doesn't have a director nomination but that doesn't cancel itself out because that has happened before argo what driving miss daisy okay um so it doesn't cancel it out and it just strikes me as the academy is not subversive enough to vote for promising young woman yet not yet 30 years from now 20 years from now possibly pulp fiction there will be blood could win best picture that type of film promising young woman well that type of film but i've n- i've never seen midnight cowboy but didn't it win best picture was that like some yes, weird it, like everybody was crazy that year or something yeah maybe it was also an x rating at the time and i've seen that film it's definitely not an x rated film especially by any of today's epically interesting porn channels on anything you put on your computer it's definitely not an x rated film it's controversial because it's about a cowboy prostitute who does controversial things, I guess is why. And I guess for 1969, if I'm not mistaken, that's when it won. Then yeah, it was probably. So yeah, that is actually a good example of them being subversive. They chose something that wasn't the norm. It wasn't the comfortable fit. Trial of the Chicago 7 is the comfortable fit. It just is. That doesn't mean that it's not worthy. I think it's as worthy as any of the other ones on the list. I honestly do. But for me, I would vote for Promising Young Woman. It is the most intellectually challenging, emotionally challenging. It's not like anything I have seen. And the bottom line, and we can talk about this more on our top 10, because obviously it will be on my top 10. That movie is being mistaken for something that it's not. It's not a revenge film, at least not for me. That movie is about forgiveness. And the second time I saw it, I went, why does she forgive the lawyer, Alfred Molina, so quickly? Why does she forgive him so quickly? Because he asked for it. And that's all she wants those guys to do. And not one of them does it. Spoilers. Not one of them goes, oh, sorry, sorry. I think if you got into this place in our Academy <laughs> Award nominations and our Oscar cast, sorry, yeah. Ooh, sorry. Well, I mean, it's then, you know what? No. I don't feel bad about that okay. one. Here's why. Because people should be keyed into that. That's true. They, I'm, pointing, I'm pointing my finger at you like I'm telling you what to do. They should be keyed into the fact that that's all she's asking for. Nobody does it. Mm-hmm. Spoiler, the dean doesn't do it. The friend who she gets drunk doesn't do it. None of the guys do it. None of them, except for the lawyer. And the moment he asks for forgiveness, she goes, you're forgiven immediately because that's what she needs in her life. 
That's what she needs is to have people ask for forgiveness for their mistakes. And I think that's the lesson of the movie. So I think that's brilliant. I think that's hard to pull off. And I think that people have taken to the movie, but 10, 15 years from now, it will be considered larger than it is now. Mm. So Trial of the Chicago 7 will win. Promising Young Woman should win. Sorry. I, I just, I feel like they had the opportunity to give it to a movie that will make more sense than the Trial of the Chicago 7. But when you're talking about Academy standards and you're talking about past history, the less divisive film wins. Do they do ranked choice voting on these? Yes. Uh, yeah, they're going to stop. I think they're going to stop that next year, though. Okay. That's probably why it's going to win, I think. Yeah, we'll go with because that. Because it's going to be in the middle of a lot of people's packs, probably. There's probably people who are huge mank files and there's going to be people who absolutely love the father and then there's going to be people who you know are big lee isaac chung fans and but trial of chicago 7 is just going to sail right on through and it's just gonna pop out at the end it's a better movie than you're giving it credit for i'll say that hey i have a question for you have you ever changed your mind about a film have you ever watched a film and not liked it and then changed your mind what is it uh, ev every coen brothers movie no that doesn't count <laughs> oh, okay Except for count. Hail Caesar. I still haven't changed my mind on Hail that Caesar. That doesn't count. Here's why. That's a adjustment time. Mm -hmm. You're adjusting to what you just saw because the Coen brothers are so unadjustable. They're so like different. Well, so that's your sensibility adjusting to them. Mm -hmm. Have you ever disliked something or been like, like the trial of the Chicago 7 and then saw it 10 years later and went, wow, this is a lot better than I remember it to be. Yeah, it's it's difficult, no. especially nowadays. No. <laughs> especially nowadays, because there's so many things that I haven't seen, and there's so many older movies that I'm trying to catch up on seeing, that if I have a choice between seeing a movie that I love mm. a bunch, or a movie I've never seen before, but I know is potentially going to be really good, or the third choice is a movie that I have seen before, did not like, and I now need to spend two hours watching it again. That's a hard ask. Mother, for example, when we'd said- Great way to answer that. Yeah, Mother, when we said, we're going to re revisit this in a year, and we watched Mother, mm -hmm. you know, that was one instance where I wasn't really on board with it, but I did it again, and there's only been a handful of, of situations like that. But yeah, for me, it's like there's so many good movies out there that, that I've already seen that I want to just see a billion more times. Indiana Jones- quadrilogy <laughs> the trilogy and then that fourth one are all coming out in in 4k in a couple months so like yeah of course i'm gonna watch all of those movies all over again that's a really josh way to answer that question that is so that is a brilliant way to look at that i never thought about it like that there just seems to be movies that i will watch again because somebody else wants to watch it and never seen it or I'm like, what did, why did I dislike that movie? I'm fascinated by trying to figure out why I disliked something. Yeah. I'm as fascinated by that then oh. as I am about how well I liked a movie. You know, there's, there's two examples. Mad Max Fury Road. I've seen it twice now. And the second time, I liked it a little bit better than the first time. But I definitely don't. I mean, people are saying that is the number one film of the 2010s, bar none. Like, I've heard people put mm. that at the top of their list. And mm. so that, I haven't come around on that yet. And then I think I need to give Hell or High Water another ch chance because there's, I'm not. I swear to God, if you're messing I'm with me right now, with, and I never swear to God. It's, yeah, it's because there's just, nobody doesn't like that movie. Nobody, <laughs> except for me. So I, I have to figure that out. So I, I need to get oh, Josh go back. Knapp against the world. Josh. Josh Knapp v. Superman. <laughs> Good Lord. You know, that's interesting because that's that still qualifies. That still counts. You liking Mad Max Fury Road just a little bit more qualifies mm -hmm. for what I'm talking about. And the fact that you'd even contemplate watching Hell or High Water again, that qualifies. But, you, you know, you make a good point. There are so many things out there to watch and so many things that are great to rewatch. Yeah. Like, why would I spend my time rewatching something like The Trial of the Chicago 7 when I haven't rewatched Mank? It, it begs the question. But something, I think it's different for me because I'm trying to figure out why people are so blown away by the trial of Chicago seven, you know, cause I liked it. I thought it was good, but I can't figure out why everybody is so, you know, Oscar it's Oscar worthy. And so I'm watching it again and I see it better, 
than I did the first time, there's a lot of great stuff going on in that film. That said, you know, I saw Promising Young Woman again and was blown away by it. Now I know I will be transfixed by that film every single time I watch it. And I will not hesitate to rewatch it. Yep. Like if somebody's like, have you seen this? Yeah. Do you want to rewatch it? Sure. Yep. You know, I might not feel that way about other pictures. I will sit through them. I, I was just watching The Blind Side, mm -hmm. Sandra Bullock. And I was, why, I was like, why am I watching this movie again? Like, what is it about me that makes it okay for me to sit through an average film? And it's average for me. It's got a lot of problems, that film. And she helps a lot. And I like the uplifting, feel-good part about it. But that's problematic, too. And I'm aware of it being problematic. And now that I have seen it through the problematic eye focus, now I can't watch it without going, oh, that's that trope that people hate. Yeah, I see that. Mm -hmm. Oh my God, did she actually just say that? Wow. And so that's, I think that's different though. I'm not re-watching The Blind Side to see if I like it better a second or third time. I'm re-watching it because of some other reason to possibly justify Sandra Bullock's winning, who I'm fine with her winning. She was good in that. So anyway, so it's fascinating. Mm. It's fascinating to see why people do what they do and how it works. Yeah, there's just way too many movies out there. All right. Well, you can check us out on the web at actorandengineer.com. You can go to facebook.com slash actorandengineer. You can tweet us at actorengineer. And you can find us on YouTube. Just search for Actor and Engineer Podcast. And we'll see you next time.